Brian, very um, warm welcome to you today. Thank you for agreeing to be on our Listen Better podcast. Um, so first of all, I'd really like to know, I know you work for a membership organisation, but what drew you to the Federation of Master Builders in the first place? Oh, that's a good question. Thanks, Annabelle. So um, I came to the Federation from the Royal Institution of Charge Surveyors. I was head of policy and spent a long time at the RICS. And before that, I was a teacher. So I started my career teaching small children in London aged between six and seven. And that equips you for any membership organisation. Uh, no problems ever since that point. Um, so uh, from, from those humble beginnings um, and then through to the RICS, uh, there was an opportunity at the Federation for a Director of External Affairs, um, which was a wider remit than I had at the RICS. So I applied, I got the job and uh, spent four and a half years as a director. And in that time, I think I was able to raise the profile of the FNB and open up doors of in government. And uh, I was asked whether I'd like to be the uh, chief executive. And uh, so I accepted. And here I am, uh, nine years on as the chief executive of the FNB. I love it that your experience as a primary school teacher has given you uh, all the experience you need for any role. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Um, I recommend you don't need to go on management training. You just need to teach six to seven year olds in a class, 25 of them, and see if you can manage and keep order. <laughs> Mine kept talking all the time. I, <laughs> I ended up more like being an entertainer than a teacher to keep them all quiet, really. Fantastic. So tell me, what have you learned over the last nine years? Um, and particularly, tell me about the state of the construct construction industry in the UK right now, following Brexit and all the travails we've had in the last two years. Yeah, well, it, it's a tough time for the, for the building industry. Um, uh, there was a, the uh, the initial shutdown at the beginning of the COVID crisis. Fortunately, the building industry got going, and we were able to work through the um, pandemic and the lockdowns. And then last year, um, there was a huge increase in demand for home improvements. So people realised actually they had a bit of extra money, they wanted more space, or they're going to move house, and so there was a huge demand. But unfortunately, there was a shortage of materials and a shortage of labour. So that those have been very difficult problems for the building industry, and we're still facing those at the moment. And it's a result of the, the COVID, the impact of Brexit, uh, increased global demand from China and America, and of course, the increase in home demand. So there, there are some tough conditions. The good thing is, I think the, the building industry has really pulled together during the pandemic. And through the work of the Construction Leadership Council, which brought in all sectors of the building industry, we've been able to work in a much more joined up fashion. And I think that's helped the industry. I think it's helped clients and consumers. And I think the government has appreciated that fact. And it, it's strengthened our position when talking to government. It's really interesting in times of adversity that people and organisations can pull together. So you're clearly facing a lot of challenges there. How do you approach them, Brian? What's your leadership style and how do you overcome and unite the team? Gosh, do you know what? I don't really analyse myself, but I, I, I'm a great believer in team leadership. So I like to get all the best people around me with expertise, listen to what they have to say and, and try to form a sort of collective decision when we're tackling all the problems that we've been facing. Um, I also think being kind to people, it's sometimes uh, not talked about very much, but I think if you treat everyone fairly, it's really important in terms of getting staff buy-in. And to be honest, you know, sometimes things don't go well. Sometimes I've had to make difficult decisions um, and you just have to be upfront. So when I have had to make those sort of decisions I prefer face to face um, and it's been quite difficult during the pandemic but I'm very proud of the fact that during the, the last 18 months or so I've not had to make one redundancy at the Federation so I've been extremely proud that we've been able to pull together have had to furlough staff but we've got them all back in and uh, you know I think most people understood what we had to do to keep the the Federation going so I think you just have to be yourself. I think that's important. Don't try to not be yourself. Um, be honest, open, kind, and know where you're going. You know, I think it's absolutely important as a chief executive, you know the direction of travel and everyone buys into that. Yes, you touched on the pandemic and I'm sure you've had to adapt a lot as all organisations have. What, if any, have been the positives from that and perhaps that you'll keep in place going forward? Well, do you know, the great revolution, I think the pandemic speeded it up 
was the fact of that virtual meetings, we could work from home as well as in the office. And we were very fortunate that we had invested shortly before the pandemic um, in our IT, all our staff had laptops. So when we were told to work from home, we were already set up to actually uh, work from home with our laptops. We didn't lose one day of, um, of work or service to our members. And I think that's been the great change in how we work at the FNB, as it would be for other sectors, um, that we can actually offer more flexible working, the hybrid working some days in the office, some days at home. And we're fortunate that we've not had to get rid of our offices. We can offer that mix. And it's, I think it's transformed, actually, the working lives of, of people, um, largely for the better. But I do appreciate that some people, if they're in cramped conditions or sharing a house, it's not always ideal, which is why we're offering the opportunity to work um, in the office. So I still think there's a need for offices. There's definitely a need to, for people to meet face-to-face -to -face with social animals. But it's good if you've got uh, other commitments that you can work from home. So we're getting a better balance. But the downside is we're getting a lot more meetings, virtual meetings, so the diary gets packed. Um, so I think we're having more meetings than we did probably before the um, the pandemic. Yes, I think there's a lot of online meeting fatigue, fatigue I heard recently. Mm. Um, so there's been some huge themes over the last couple of years, 18 months, we've had pandemic, we've got obviously the, the increasing climate change worries, the mental health issues that are falling out from the pandemic, Brexit and talent shortages. I mean, where do you start as a, <laughs> as a chief executive of a membership organisation? How do you tackle some of these big themes? Yeah, well, we have to prioritise. And, and I think in the for our construction sector and for our members, we've been very much focused on zero carbon. It's the big issue of our time about how we tackle climate change. And we've been doing a lot of work on retrofitting. How do we make our existing homes more energy efficient? And we've been um, doing that work through the Construction Leadership Council, developing a strategy. And that's been very, very helpful, I think, in combining the industry behind a sort of joint policy agenda that fed into the, the COP26. So a great opportunity there for all our industry to actually be uh, calling for this change. Um, building safety is very high on the government's agenda, as it should be following Grenville. So obviously we need to make sure that our industry is operating at the highest standards so we don't have a repeat of that. And for us at the Federation, we've been on quite a long journey in moving away from being a traditional trade body where companies paying the money, getting the badge to one that's being more professional so that we're actually saying, no, we've got strict criteria. You will need to undergo an independent inspection to join us. So we're not gonna take any old building company. We're gonna take the best building companies and build up the reputation of the F&B and as well as the industry. Um, so that's been very, very important to me personally in terms of changing the image of the FNB. And then in terms of other issues that we've, we've been facing, you mentioned men mental health, Annabelle. We were looking at this before the pandemic. And so we've got mental health first aiders in, in the Federation. And I think that's re been really helpful because um, we know a lot of people have been suffering during the pandemic for mental health problems. I think it's great we're talking about it as an industry because it's been quite hidden I, I know a lot of men have found it in the past quite difficult to talk about mental health and the rate of suicide is quite high in our industry so we we need to get better at saying let, let's have these open discussions about mental health there's no stigma attached to it but we're going further in the FNB we're looking at uh, equality and diversity and inclusion we're at the beginning of this uh, of this journey so we're benchmarking attitudes within the FNB at the moment and seeing what we can do and improve our understanding. So I think there's a lot to be done there. That's going to take years, really, I think, to get to the point where we should be. And also, as part of the climate change, we're looking at how we can minimise our carbon emissions. Um, so we're working with the Energy Saving Trust at the moment to look at opportunities to see where we can minimise our carbon emissions. So. As a trade body, obviously it's extremely important to be uh, providing the service to our members, but we need to be progressive. We need to make sure that we are addressing the issues facing our industry and society at this time. 
and we need to attract the best people into the federation who want who want to commit to what we're doing because i see it as an ongoing change and we need to adapt and hopefully be proactive in what we're doing gosh you've got a lot on your plate but it sounds like you are being extremely proactive and moving it from a traditional member body as you said into something that's future proof and representative of the, of the diverse um uh, talent force in the uk at the moment interesting stuff so brian I, taken a lot of your time already and I know you've got a lot on your plate as we've said but what advice would you give others um, perhaps considering a career in a membership organization what would it give them what are the, the highs and the, and the great plus points about working for a trade body well I, I think working with trade bodies is a fantastic career um, if you like people I think the important thing is you've got to like people because uh, that's what you're doing day in day out it's about addressing people's needs trying to provide a good service it's representing their interests to other stakeholders particularly in the government in the media so if you love people i think you're going to love working in a membership organization uh the downside is sometimes they feel a bit like political parties you get different factions so you you really important that you can actually develop a common agenda get people to come in behind you but i think you can be a force for change if you are leading a, a membership organization um, compared to some backbench MPs who have very limited opportunities, um, trade bodies do have the opportunity to talk to government ministers, senior civil servants, um, talk to the media. You can really make the difference and that makes it exciting. Thank you. Thanks so much for your time today, Brian. And, no, thank uh, you, Annabelle. Have a very good year ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you.